you, you can watch a movie. You don't even have to read the book. Uh, but when Dickens wrote Ebenezer Scrooge, if you didn't know this, A Christmas Carol, he wrote down things that he heard people say, and Scrooge said those things. And people had gotten to where Christmas was not a big deal, and there's actually a movie called The Man Who Saved Christmas about the writing of this story, which was a reminder for all of us to go out of our way, especially this time of year for people who are hurting, um, for people who aren't like us, for people who are different, for people who are struggling. And so I want to encourage you this time of year especially to do that, to look for opportunities to go out of your way, because here's the truth. Listen, the wise men, which we're going to talk about this Friday night, the wise men that gave gifts, their purpose was not the gifts, it was to worship Jesus. But the reason that that's such a big deal is because God gave us more than we could ever give. You could not have a relationship with God without a relationship with Christ. You could not measure up to God's perfection because we're not good enough. Most people, I've rarely had anybody who when I've said to them, do you think you're perfect? Um, Most people even if they thought that, wouldn't admit it. Um, But the truth is, we all know that that one person who thinks they're perfect is the biggest jerk. Oh, sorry, didn't mean for you to raise your hand. Okay, But the person who thinks they're perfect is probably the biggest jerk you know, right? And, And so the truth is, we all need a Savior. And that's what Christmas is really about. And I love, today we're going to talk about the shepherds. This is the most famous story. Normally I would read this. Uh, Christmas Eve service, but this year we're going to do the wise men for Christmas Eve service. But I love the story of the shepherds because it reminds us that all of us are welcome at the feet of Jesus, no matter what your life is like. See, shepherds in the time of Christ, even if these, listen, and, and there's this whole teaching which could be true that these were temple shepherds, but even if that's true, they were not welcome in the temple. They were considered unclean. They were not allowed into worship. They were cast off. And I don't know if you've ever felt less than, but most of us at some time felt less than. I grew up because uh, I'm ADD. And so when you're ADD, you get distracted. So if you have ADD kids, you know they tend to spill stuff at the table. They tend to get in a hurry, so they'll break things and not mean to. That was me. You know, growing up, so those things happen. And so what happens when you do that? You get people mad at you. People say things to you, and you suddenly feel less than everyone else. If you were a shepherd in Bethlehem, by the way, Bethlehem was, I mean, it made Mims look like Uptown Suzanne. I know she lives in Mims. Uh, you, You know, you had Rome, which was like awesome, and then you had other cities, and then you had Bethlehem, the Scotsmore of their day, right? Just nobody wanted to be from Bethlehem. And, and even one of the criticisms of Jesus was, from Bethlehem? I mean, if you were from Bethlehem, that's how people would respond, like, Bethlehem? Really? That's where you grew up? You know? And so this is where Jesus is born. It's where these shepherds, which were kind of bottom of the totem pole, were watching sheep, and yet... This whole story is that God gives you and I an opportunity to be in His presence. And so even if you don't feel worthy, even if you don't feel like you measure up, God has given you and I the best gift we could ever have. And do you remember an awesome Christmas as a kid? You know, I talked to my mom about Christmas, and a a few years ago she let me know that she never had Christmas. And when we were kids, my mom went crazy at Christmas. Uh, My dad put two Christmas trees together and drilled holes. So we had this huge Christmas tree. Mom went, we had parties. And a few years ago, my mom said, you know, we never had a Christmas tree growing up. What? Yeah, one time we did when I was a teenager, but only because we begged my dad. So he bought one on Christmas Eve and threw it away on Christmas Day. And I went, 
And yet she goes out of her way to celebrate Christmas and to make it awesome for everybody. She used to go down, her and my dad would go down to the migrant farms in Miami and bring gifts. She tells a story about one Christmas going down there and she didn't have enough gifts. And as she was giving out the gifts, she realized she didn't have enough. She started crying and saying, God, I don't have enough gifts. And the next thing she knows, this whole group of people showed up with gifts for everybody else. They had enough gifts. And she said to me recently, she said, I have no idea who those people were, where they came from, or where they went. But it was an answer to prayer. And so all I can think is, hallelujah, you know. And so this happens on the night that we celebrate Christmas is this whole idea of the Shepherds who did not have their act together, who had no reason for God to come to them. And yet, God says, hey, Gabriel, I got a job for you tonight. Later, you'll be stopping Pastor Eric at red lights in order to teach him patience. But for now, we're going to have you do something important. If you missed that story last week, you might want to listen to that one. And to these shepherds, it was the best gift they had ever been given. You know, gifts sometimes are weird because you never know what matters. This is one of the best gifts I ever received. What a weird thing. This is medical adhesive remover. <laughs> Why would that be an awesome gift? Because not long after Christmas, I was in the hospital for 30 days. And one of the things that had to happen is every single day they would remove bandages and put a new set back on with sponges Every single day. And every single day I went, ow, 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 for about 15 minutes as they ripped off these bandages. Until one of the nurses walked in and said, I've got something for you. Psh, whoop. And I went, what was that? That was the best thing I've ever had happen. And she said, I'm going to leave this for you and everybody could use it. Best gift ever. If I gave this to you, you'd be like, you are weird and I don't want that. <laughs> now, here's what's awesome about God. He knows exactly what you need. And he sent Jesus. And not only did he send Jesus, he sent Jesus in a way where we understand the gift we've been given. And so today I'm going to talk about not only what God gave to us, but I want you to, then I want to take, because I don't want to just learn something and have some information when you leave here. I want you to be able to do something practical. So here's what the deal. When we become like Christ, the idea is we're going to act like Christ. As Christians. So if you're a Christian today, my hope is not only you'll learn what God has done for you, but then you'll say, okay, so how can I do that for someone else? And I'm going to give you three practical ways you can apply this message and do something for someone else. So here's the three things. Number one, God's gifts are what we need. If, if, if you came up to somebody and handed them medical adhesive remover... If you were driving somewhere and you saw some people with a sign that said, I'm hungry, and you handed them medical adhesive remover, I would not blame them for chucking it back at you. Because it's not what they need, but if it's something you need, it's a big deal. God knew just what we needed. So let's pick up the story, and if you have a blanket, you can hold it, and you can feel like Linus today. In those days, by the way, if this was not a true story, it would have said once upon a time here. But not only is it a true story, they give some specific things that were going on so that you can check their work. So that you can see, is what he's saying true? And so Luke is telling this story. He said, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Which, by the way, for years historians would say, that was never true, that was never true, that was never true. And then guess what? They found evidence of this census. Oh, I guess we are wrong. Yeah, well, we knew that. We saw it before. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. By the way, he was a temporary guy. They found out later. They found his name on a coin. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph 
also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. And David, remember, was a shepherd. Not only was David a shepherd, but David was out with the sheep when uh, uh, the prophet came and said, bring out all your sons because I'm going to make one of them king. And his own dad said, get everyone except David. Talk about feeling rejected. It'd be like if your dad lined you up and the guy said, one of these guys is going to be king, and he actually took you out of the line. Like, well, I know you're not talking about this one. That was David, the shepherd boy. And then it continues, because he belonged to the house and line of David, he went there to register. Now, this is funny. I never thought about this with Mary. Do you know that the Romans did not require Mary to come? But Joseph wasn't leaving his pregnant wife at home. Good job, Randy. (laughs) If you don't get that joke, you need to come to church more often. She was pledged to be married to him, was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Oh, what how fun that had to be. Oh. Tell me you just ate too much. I think it's time. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, you notice it doesn't say placed him in a manger because that's where they wanted to be. No, placed him in a manger because the place they wanted to be was not available. Does that ever sound like your life? There was some group that said you can't always get what you want. They're going to live forever, it seems like. I don't know. Bethlehem, the city of David. Micah says this, Bethlehem, though you be small, out of you will rise a ruler. And so Micah, hundreds of years before this, prophesied where Jesus would be born. God worked out even a tax time. Boy, that sounds awful, doesn't it? Just for them. Jesus could have been born in Rome. Rome, gosh, running water, lighted streets, Trevi Fountain, right? All this amazing architecture, but instead, Scottsmore. By the way, Scottsmore's uptown compared to Bethlehem at this town. I mean, they, they got a tractor supply, you know. That's Mim said, has a tractor supply. Yeah. I even got corrected on that. All right. You got the Dollar General. That's right. We, we have some Scottsmoreites here today helping us with their... Almost as bad as Chuliota. Think about it. David's brothers gave him a hard time, if you recall, years before. Imagine what Jesus' brothers and family gave him a hard time. I mean, can you imagine? Where were you born? Bethlehem. (laughs) And where were you born? Manger scene. I mean, they probably called him sheep boy. Hey, kid. Get it? Right? You know how kids are. They find that out, they picked on. Listen, why would God allow his son to be born in a manger? So that we understand that he didn't just come for the elite. By the way, the reason the Magi come, the reason that these rulers come, and all these people, is also so that we can know we're also never too good to bow at his feet. So they come. And Jesus is born. In Galatians it says it this way, but when the set time had fully come, and that word fully there means a full ship. Now what does that mean? Well, when you went fishing, you'd fill the ship up and then you'd come back to port. If you've ever watched Deadliest Catch, that still happens today. We don't have enough crab, we got to keep going. And so this is the fullness of time. The ship is full. It's ready to come in. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. And then it says something even bigger. 
that we might receive adoption to sonship. What did we need? God knew we weren't good enough. We didn't have it together enough. So he sent Jesus. Why? Just so that we could work our way to heaven? No, so that we could be adopted. I have an adopted daughter. Even when she does something bad, I don't get to say, you're out of here. She's still part of the family. And if you have adopted siblings, there may have been days that you were like, really? But if you had a family like mine, they were even more children sometimes than you were. And the truth is, when God adopts us, He gives us all the rights of His child. He knew what we needed. We needed to be part of the family. And if you're Italian, you say, part of the family. This week, I want you to consider something practically. Is there anybody around you who has a need that you can meet? And I want you to be careful that you don't just think money. Because the truth is, sometimes what people need is just a note from you, a smile from you, some encouragement from you. Sometimes people just need to know that they're accepted and loved. By the way, you can love someone and not love what they do. If you have children, you totally get that. And if you have grandchildren, well, you're out of balance. I'm just saying. You're, you might encourage them even when they're bad. I don't know, right? But the truth is, you love them even when you don't like what they do. And God absolutely loves us. So, so maybe this week, it's acceptance that somebody needs. Maybe it's encouragement. Maybe it's a note to somebody. Maybe it's just checking on somebody. Maybe you just pray and say, God, would you show me somebody in my life that has a need that I can meet? And maybe it is financial. Maybe it's where you go out of your way. Maybe it's encouragement. You know, a lot of people are discouraged this time of year. A lot of pastors are discouraged this time of year. Did you know that? This time of year is weird for pastors. It's weird. It's just, it's just out of balance. And so a lot of pastors get discouraged. So I check on all my friends this time of year. Hey, you doing okay? So who do you need to check on? Ask God. God, show me what somebody needs. Number two, God's gifts are for everyone. Luke 2, 8 through 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So they're out there. It's quiet. Maybe they hear a lion or a tiger or a bear. You're a little late. It's all right. (laughs) But they're sitting there. They're looking into the darkness, right? They've maybe got a lamp here. I don't know if you've ever held a lamp near you and tried to look out in the darkness. So you kind of hold it behind you and you're looking and all you see is eyes looking out at you. So imagine this is the scene and it's quiet and they're listening for wild animals that they might have to fight off. And then this is what happens next. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Do you blame them? Apparently angels don't have fade in. What's that? What's that? Oh, it's getting brighter. No, it's just... And it says the glory of the Lord. This is that Shekinah glory. It's the idea that when somebody is in God's presence, they glow for a while afterwards. That's what happened to Moses. Moses actually came down from meeting with God, and the people were like, could you cover that up? So part of me this year wondered, is that what it was like being around Jesus initially? When Jesus was born and in the manger, did he glow? I don't know. But the angel said to them what angels always say except to Balaam, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news which will cause great joy. And then what does he say? To all the people. And then he says this, Today in the town of David a Savior has been, now listen to what he says next, born to you, losers. No, he doesn't say losers, but that's how they felt. Right? These guys, why would I deserve for an angel to come to me? Why would I? I'm just a shepherd. I'm not even allowed in the temple. And the angel comes and says, he's been born for everyone's going to have joy. But guess what? Born to you. Today in the town of David. And they're like, seriously? Bethlehem? Really? Scottsmore? Really? 
A Savior's been born to you. He is the Messiah. By the way, there's a teaching out there now that Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Uh, uh, Okay. The Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The glory of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever been felt unworthy. I don't know if you ever felt like you were out of place. I used to move harpsichords. Our, our band teacher was also a harpsichord player, so he'd hire some of us in high school, and we'd move harpsichord into billion-dollar homes in Miami. And I can remember carrying these harpsichords and walking into these houses And we were suit and tie, and we'd have to wait as Mr. Heath played his harpsichord, which if you haven't been around a harpsichord, you feel out of place instantly. And he would play, and we would stand in the corner. And I remember thinking, I do not belong here. I could hear the song in my head, one of these things is not like the others. You go into a store that's really fancy and you almost feel like, I don't know. I had a friend who used to tell silk socks in West Palm Beach. He, he sold socks that were thousands of dollars. I wouldn't even go in the store. I'm like, I'm not going in there. I don't belong there. But then I walk into Walmart and I'm like the king. Right? I got shoes on. Got most of my teeth. Right? Isn't it funny how we go from one way to the other? We feel like we don't belong, and then we feel like we're better than? When the angel appears to the shepherds, first he says, this is good news for everybody, but guess what? Jesus is born for you. So even though you feel left out, even though you're not welcome in the temple, even though you're not welcome in a time of worship, even though you're not welcome maybe even by your family, even though maybe right now you don't smell so good because you just hugged a sheep, The angel came to them. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, it says in Titus 3, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Why? So having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs. Having the hope of eternal life. Here's that idea that we're part of the family. But Eric, I don't deserve to be part of the family. That's the whole point. The shepherds did not deserve for the angel to come to them. By the way, the angel then does not show up at Jesus' manger. The shepherds show up there. And the shepherds are the one that tell other people, not the angels. The angels could have, but that's not God's plan. He uses normal, ordinary, broken, messed up people. By the way, thank you, all of you who serve and lead. I I was so excited this morning as I got here early, and a bunch of people were already parked way out in the grass because they said, we want to leave room for our guests. And I thought, "What what an amazing way to serve, to go out of your way. The shepherds, as broken and messed up as they were, God said, I'm coming to them first. I'm going to show you the way in a humble setting. Number three, God's gifts are miraculous. When the angel had left them and gone into Bethlehem, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And I'm sure you've noticed this next verse, but I'm going to give you a practical application here in a second. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. So the second practical thing that I did not give you was be willing to give to anyone. Go out of your way to give and to bless someone who's not like you. But the fact that God's gifts are miraculous should remind us that the shepherds were sent to Jesus. 
not the angels. And when you feel like you're not good enough to do what God wants you to do, I want to remind you that that's not who God uses. He uses the humble. And then it says that Mary treasured these things. She pondered them in her heart. What's really wild is that we've just discovered what was going on. In our society, people have started talking about being aware and present where you are. And that you can actually improve your mood just by recognizing where you are and paying attention to where you are. Mary was doing that. What was she doing? She was pondering, that means paying attention to, and treasuring. Now, you know what our problem is in our world? We're always looking at what's next, our next problem, our next situation, our next worry, our next frustration, the next thing we got to fix, the retirement that needs to happen, this other thing that needs to happen, this next step of things. And we're always doing that. And have we taken time to ponder, to breathe for some of you, and to treasure? Some of you have been so busy today, you haven't treasured the person next to you. So would you just take a minute, maybe pat them on the shoulder, and treasure them for just a second. Not punch them. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says this, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called, I love this, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to quit focusing on who you are and ask God to give you a miraculous gift to give someone else. For the shepherds, it was them sharing with others what God had done for them. And maybe that's what it is for you. But it could just be that God will use some gift that you have, some talent you have, in order to bless someone else. But ask God, God, would you give me a miraculous gift to give somebody else? And by the way, that doesn't have to be an awesome, amazing, expensive thing. It just has to be what someone needs. And I'll tell you what people mostly need is the love of Jesus. And I want to encourage you everywhere you go to give that. Go out of your way. Look for those opportunities. I love the end of It's a Wonderful Life. If you've never seen It's a Wonderful Life and you don't have two hours, watch the last 30 minutes. If you don't have 30 minutes, watch the last 10. And one of the things the angel says (laughs) to the guy is, you've been given a great gift, a chance to see what life would be like without you. And the whole movie is about the fact that he was making a difference in other people's lives and didn't even know it. And if you're a believer today, I know you might be in the middle of a lot of stuff. And you might be hurting and you might be struggling and you might be sad and you might be discouraged. And you might be going through a huge valley right now. But I want you to know that you matter and God has you here for a reason and a purpose. And even if you feel like a shepherd or if you feel like a king, God can use you every day. Even in this season where maybe you're struggling and hurting. I want to encourage you to use the gifts God's given you to be a blessing. Even if you feel discouraged, to go out of your way, put your discouragement behind you and bless someone else. Because life would not be the same without you. So keep going. Keep fighting. Know that even if you were born in Scottsmore, God can still use you. And even if you were born in the greatest city on earth, God can still use you and he loves you. Whether you feel like a shepherd or a wise man, God can use you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to him, knowing that you're a sinner, that you've messed up and you can't come to God on your own, but you can surrender your life to him. And when you do, the Bible says he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. It's undeserved grace. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, you've had a lot going on. And maybe you feel like a failure lately. I'm sure some of those shepherds felt like failures that day. 
And yet thousands of years later, we're reading their story. You are making a difference even in the middle of your hardest day. So don't give up. I'm praying for you. And if I can pray for you, you feel free to come and share with me too. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you that you came to shepherds, that you came in the environment of shepherds, that, Lord, you came in humility to show us that we could have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, I also pray, I know that this time of year is so discouraging for some, so overwhelming for some. Lord, I pray instead of getting busy and all the stuff, that, Lord, we could ponder, that we could treasure. Help us to treasure those who you've given us. Help us to treasure these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a time of giving now.